Hello everyone, welcome again. So today's lesson will be on the chemical earth topic in year 11 chemistry. And in today's lesson, we're going to focus on common covalent substances that we see in sort of everyday life, okay? So we looked at, in the previous lesson, all these different types of bonding, and we've seen different examples of those like metallic, ionic substances. So now we're going to look at common examples of covalent substances in our environment. Okay. So common covalent molecular elements. Many of the elements that are present in the Earth's atmosphere exist as covalent molecular substances. Okay. So nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, they all exist as molecules in the atmosphere, and, but that is their elemental state. That is the state that we would find them in, in their element form. Now typically, these are non-metals, obviously, because they're gases, fall into this category. So some examples include O2, N2, or H2, I didn't mention H2 yet, but H2 is one of them as well. These are all elemental forms of these elements, uh, but they exist as molecules. Okay. The formation of these diatomic gases is for the, each atom to achieve stability. So the reason why we have N2, O2, H2, and all of these other ones is because by bonding together in a covalent mole molecule, we get stability for both atoms. So that's why we try to force this issue um, in nature. These diatomic gases are essential for our survival. We need these diatomic gases or we won't survive. So obviously the first one we'll talk about is oxygen. So oxygen is vitally important um, and it exists as a covalent molecular substance. Okay? So obviously we can understand the importance of oxygen. We need to breathe it in to get energy and if we stop breathing, we die. Um, that's just how it works. So it exists as, so this diatomic oxygen exists as two oxygen atoms bonded together um, covalently. Now between the oxygen atoms there are two bonds which we call a double bond in which four electrons are shared amongst the atoms. Okay? So what that looks like is here's one oxygen okay, and it's got six electrons in its outer shell and it's found its partner which has also six electrons in its outer shell. And what it'll do to get eight is it'll actually share, each atom will share two with the other atom, giving you eight electrons in each shell. So if I was to erase this one, you can see there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And if I obviously do the same on the other side, um, then you would also count eight. And how we represent that um, in a more compact way is we write it like this. So with two lines rather than all these dots. Okay. Now, we call that a double bond because obviously there are two bonds. And, but a double bond means that there are four electrons being shared between the atoms. Okay. So just be aware of that. Okay. So what about covalent network elements? We saw a lot of covalent molecular substances, but what about a covalent network element? So elements that exist as network substances are likely to be semi-metal elements. So elements that are semi-metals. So you could put things in like silicon, germanium, or carbon. Carbon is not necessarily a semi-metal, but it does act like this as well. So that's okay. <laughs> so often covalent network substances are found, covalent network compounds are found, rather than the elements, the covalent network elements. So we more likely find covalent network compounds compared to covalent network elements. So an example of this would include SiO2, so silicon dioxide. Silicon dioxide is sand or quartz, so we see that all the time. So that's just an example of a covalent network compound. So one example of a covalent network element would be diamond. Diamond is a covalent network substance formed from purely carbon. So here is a nice example of a diamond. Okay. Each carbon atom in the structure is bonded to the four adjacent carbon atoms around it. Okay. So each carbon atom has four sitting around it, and it's bonded to each of those four. 
And each of those four is bonded to another four, et cetera, et cetera, and add on to infinitum. Okay, so it's um, so that's how it's bonded together in a big network substance. This creates an incredibly hard substance, and it happens to be the hardest substance known to man. Um, that's diamond for you. And diamond can only be formed through the intense pressures and temperatures deep within the Earth. So within the Earth, there's extreme pressure and very high temperatures. And in only these cases can we form diamond. Um, we can't form diamond naturally, uh, artificially. It only happens naturally. Though there is some work being done where we have formed some artificial diamonds, but they're not as good quality as the ones that we dig out of the Earth. Okay? So that concludes today's lesson on common covalent um, substances. We looked at common covalent molecular substances and common covalent network structures. Um, and we looked at an example of each. So hopefully you've learned something about these chemicals and hopefully you'll be able to answer some of the questions that are coming up. Okay. So identify one element that exists as a network structure. So you've got neon, which is a noble gas, so it doesn't even bond, so it's not A. We know that oxygen and nitrogen are both molecular substances, so we know that, that it's neither C or D. But carbon can form a covalent network substance in diamond or graphite, so we know that B is our answer. Okay? With reference to the bonding exhibited, explain why diamond is often used as coatings for high-speed saw blades. So a lot of people will say, uh, a lot of companies will say, our super awesome diamond blade um, blade has diamond coating because, and that is um, good for your saw, for your sawing and things of that nature. Now the reason they have that is to increase the durability of the saw. So why is that? Well, this application requires a high strength material that doesn't deform easily. So you don't want it to deform because that's how blunting happens. So if you imagine this is what a blade looks like when you get very close to it, as soon as something hits it, it might get a little bit blunt, and that's because of deformation. So you can see it's getting blunter and blunter. And, but what you want is you don't want it to get blunt. You want it to be as sharp for as long as possible. So you use diamond, because diamond doesn't deform very well. So diamond is an extremely hard substance due to the covalent, strong covalent network structure that it forms. So the fact that it forms this very strong covalent network substance means that when you have a very sharp point, it's not going to deform as much as another substance. Okay. Graphite, which is made from carbon, is electrically conductive, soft, and optically very different from diamond. What can you conclude about the structure of carbon atoms in graphite? Okay. The, carbons, the carbon atoms in graphite are bonded in a significantly different way to the comp, uh, compared to a diamond. Okay. So they're bonded very differently to the way a carbon is bonded in a diamond. Since both are made from the same element, the fact that they exhibit such different properties implies the bonding is different, or the way they're bonded is different. The, the, the arrangement of atoms is different. In graphite atoms, uh, graf in graphite, sorry, carbon atoms are arranged in two-dimensional hexagonal sheets. So they're formed like this, like that, hexagons, where each of them is C. Whereas, um, obviously in the diamond case, it's the three-dimensional form um, where there's each carbon is bonded to four adjacent carbons. Okay? And each of these hexagonal sheets, which I just drew, are weakly bonded to other sheets above and below it. Okay? So you essentially kind of stack sheets on top of each other, and they're all weakly bonded together. And that's why a pencil works, because when you draw a line on a pencil, what you're doing is you're leaving behind all these graphite sheets, and each of these sheets leaves sort of a black mark, which means that you've left a line. Okay? So you're leaving the carbon sheets behind as you write and draw with a pencil. Okay? Question 14. By looking at the elements that form covalent network structures, what trends do you notice? Well, the semi-metals are the most likely to form covalent network structures. And it's probably because they have the most number of bonds, usually four or, you know, they can form four or three bonds, which means that they can form large sort of networks because they can f make bonds with, you know, adjacent four 
atoms. So that's why they tend to form these network structures. This is due to the unique properties of their valence shell. Since many semi-metals have four valence electrons, they can form many bonds with adjacent atoms rather than forming a small number of bonds with one atom making a molecule or something. Okay? So that's why they tend to form network structures. And so because they can make bonds with lots of adjacent atoms, they can allow the network structure to develop. Okay? So carbon can form a maximum of four bonds. Explain why carbon cannot form a covalent molecular substance like C2. So how come you don't see C2, but you see O2 and N2 and you know, F2 and Cl2? Why is C so different? Well, for carbon to form C2, it would have to form a quadruple bond. So it would have to form four bonds so that both carbons are stable. This means that all eight electrons will be concentrated into one section. So if you imagine a quadruple bond, all of the electrons would be here. So that's eight electrons, all in one small area. Now, because you have so many um, negative charges, the repulsive force would be really big, making this structure very unstable. So with eight electrons sitting there, the repulsive force would be so big that you know, the electrons would just repel each other and smash apart those bonds. So it doesn't make sense to make C2 because it would just be so unstable. Okay. So that concludes today's lesson on coval common covalent substances. We looked at covalent molecular substances and also covalent network substances. And we saw examples of each and how they differ and also um, what are some common examples that we see every day. So hopefully you've learned something. And in the next lesson, we'll be looking at using properties um, to sort of identify different bonding um, types. So I look forward to seeing you at our next lesson.